Good morning. morning. My privilege to welcome you here to worship. I'm Jamie Alexander. I'm one of the pastors. On behalf of our whole church, we're so happy that you've chosen to be with us in worship today. And I ask you to join me as we pray and we dedicate our service of worship before the Lord. Father, we're grateful to you for this day that you have prepared for us. We ask for you to come and to meet us here. And Father, we pray that all that we offer to you will be pleasing to you. Father, help us to pray as Hannah prayed and to worship as Hannah prayed this morning as we focus upon Hannah, a woman of faith. We're so honored that you love us so dearly and so completely. And as we gather here, we gather here in your name, we gather here in your love, and we gather here in your grace. And it's in the name of your Son, who is Lord and Savior of our life, that we pray. And together we say, Amen. Amen. Got a few announcements this morning. One that's at the very top of the announcements page is, as you're leaving this Sunday morning, there are carnations for all the women and, and young girls in our congregation. We've got red ones and white ones and pink ones. And the good thing about this service is, it's the last service of the day, so whatever's left, you can probably get all of them, maybe. We will save a few of those. We've got some uh, women that are not able to be with us this morning, so we will deliver those this week. So it's a wonderful thing to have flowers. Uh, there's a meeting for Vacations Bible School on Tuesday, May 15th. It's a planning meeting. If you'd like to be part of that, you're welcome, and we'd like to invite you. There's a Rummage and Bazaar organizational meeting that will be Sunday, May 20th at 1 p.m. in the chapel. So you're welcome to do that. I like the next one. It says Bazaar News. I don't know what Bazaar News is, but it's got to be strange, right? But no, there's news about the bazaar. All right. The Naomi Circle, I want to make note, they're uh, changing their meeting place and location. They're going to meet on the 15th at 1 o'clock in Becker Hall. So that's a change for them. Make note of that. Metfield Methodists are meeting. The Two Serve Shepherd Group is meeting. Pack a sack. I want to remind you that any week you can bring pack a sack items and leave them out here on the table in the narthex. They'll take them any time, but next week is their standard time where you, they get most of their food and they'll sort that. So bring those. We have a, uh, can you spare a quarter, brother or sister, can you spare a quarter, uh, what are we calling, this one's gotten me confused, but it's a Stop Hunger Now campaign, and quarters will buy actually a small meal. It will buy a meal of soy protein, rice, and vitamins, that one quarter. So we've got places you can uh, give your quarters in the banks, They're the little, uh, the, like the goat banks, and then there's, I don't know if they call them the tubes, you know, where they put the, the quarters in. We've got those around the Narthex and Becker Hall, but drop your quarters in there. And if you want to, uh, our Arkansas Annual Conference is meeting on June 10th down at Fort Smith for a couple of days. But you can go down, travel down to Fort Smith, and help pack up all these meals that are being purchased with the quarters. So you can actually give your quarters and then go pack meals if you like. It's something that you can do and, and be in service for our church and for people literally around the world with that service. Next week is Pentecost Sunday. Wear red. Now, I've got somebody in every... Uh, worship service is going to call me next Sunday morning and remind me to wear red. So y'all remember to wear red. It's Pentecost Sunday. It's also Confirmation Sunday. We have eight confirmands that are going to be confirmed in our 930 Contemporary Worship Service. We've got several being baptized. We've got some banners up here that they've created. And it's going to be a special time in that service. Now, they will come at the end of the 8 o'clock service and be introduced. And they'll be here in the beginning of this service next week to be introduced. So you'll get to meet seven of those eight young people. One is having to travel for a sister's graduation. So he's not going to be with us, but we're going to have a little special time for him also. But we want to celebrate those confirmands next week on Pentecost Sunday. Now, the last one I want to make an announcement for is All Church Work Day this Saturday. We'll be doing everything from changing light bulbs to uh, chopping down trees and washing windows. So at 8.30 is when it begins, and it's, I was told it's going to continue till all the work is done, done or until I leave. So whatever you want to do, you can come on next Saturday, the 19th, and work here around the church, meet people, and have a good time as we uh, work in our, our building and our facilities and our grounds and, and enjoy all that we have, we have and what God has given us.
we are stand, as we're standing together this morning, let us uh, confirm our faith with our Apostles' Creed. It's found in our bulletin and also on our screens this morning. I believe in God the Father Almighty, Maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and in life everlasting. God is good. And all the time. We're so glad you're here. And we want to thank you for submitting the photographs that you've sent in, that you submitted honoring your mother. And following the greeting time, we'll be presenting that video. Now, the video has been made just especially for this service. If you said you worshiped in this service. Because if we had, you were so gracious in all the photographs you submitted that we would be here all day. Watching, watching that video. But if you would like to see the video in its totality, it is being shown in the narthex on the television there. And so we take, ask you to take a time to, to look at that as you're able. But thank you. And we're so honored today that we can celebrate and honor our mothers in this way. We're glad that you're here and we thank you for visiting with us. We greet those around you and welcome everybody in the name of the Lord.
Give me that old-time religion. Give me that old-time religion. Give me that old-time religion. It's good enough for me. Yes, give me that old-time religion. Give me that old-time religion. Give me that old-time religion. It's good enough for me. It was good for the Hebrew children. It was good for the Hebrew children. It was good for the Hebrew children. It's good enough for me. It was good for Paul and Silas. It was good for Paul and Silas. It was good for passage of scripture today comes from Matthew chapter 19 verses 13 through 15. Listen to the word of God. Then people brought little children to Jesus for him to place his hands on them and pray for them. But the disciples rebuked them. Jesus said, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. When he had placed his hands on them, he went on from there. This is the word of God for the people of God. I'd like to invite our ushers to come forward for our time of our tithes and our offerings. This morning we give, we give back a little bit of what God has given us. We give in joy and thanksgiving for the women in our lives, for our mothers, our grandmothers, our daughters. We give for all those women around the world who are probably in need. Women and children suffer more than any around the world. If you have an extra dollar in your pocket, we like to give that extra dollar because it will make possibly a world of difference to someone in God's creation.
most gracious and giving God, we give back to you a little of what you have given us. Prayerfully take our gifts, multiply them, use them for your kingdom. Lord, we pray that we give in joy and happiness in the life that you've given us and all that we believe. In your holy and precious name we pray. Amen. I invite you to be seated. As you take your seats, if you would, there's a slim insert in your bulletin. It has our celebrations, our cares, and our concerns on one side. On the other, we have our mission of the month. And at the very bottom of that side, Redemption Point Pentecostal Church is the community of faith that we are praying for this week. We ask that you keep them in your prayers also. We have several arrangements up here. One is in honor of RMA Calhoun for Mother's Day from her family. RMA. The other is yellow, orange, green, and purple arrangement from Roger Scholes. From Roger Scholes, in memory of his mother Ruth, those were her favorite colors. So Roger has done well to remember his mother's favorite colors. We have white carnations, two on the altar this morning, one in memory of Helen Claire Bothwell, who passed away on Saturday, May 5th. Her service will be in the sanctuary here on Tuesday the 15th 
at 3 p.m. with the reception to follow. We also have a white carnation uh, in memory of Lee Johnson who passed away on May 9th. His service will be held here on the following the week following, Tuesday the 22nd at 2 p.m. here in the sanctuary. I want to lift up uh, Tim Ireland to you in, your pr in our prayers. Tim is not doing well at all. He was taken to Mercy this weekend and then airlifted to Springfield. And so he is very much struggling, and we want to keep him in your prayers and his family and, and Judy in your prayers. We have a number of people convalescing at home and nursing care facilities. We always want to keep so many people in our prayers. We want to keep each other in our prayers, our church, our community. It is a full-time job to pray for all those around us, and I ask that you pray diligently for one another. Um, as we go to our prayer this morning, I'd like to add one more thing. I want to keep uh, Keith and Coel and Sturwald in your prayers and their family as their grandson had an accident on a four-wheeler up in Chicago area, and he's in the hospital also. Lots of things going on, but let's uh, prepare this morning now in song for our prayer. Most gracious and merciful God, we gather together this morning for worship. We gather to worship you on a day when we celebrate our mothers. We celebrate women, our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren, our daughters. Lord, we celebrate them this morning in our worship service. And Lord, we pray for them. We pray for the women in our lives, not just our mothers, but those women who have meant so much to us, whether grandmothers or that woman that you simply called your aunt who was no more, was not our relative. Lord, we celebrate those women who have impacted our lives, that have changed our lives in faith for you. Lord, we lift up those in our congregation who have lost loved ones. We have lost so many over this year, it seems like, God, that Heal our hearts. Lord, comfort us. Give us those memories that are full of life and joy. Lord, help us to see all those around us who live. Those that live and need us, that need our care and need our touch. Help us to seek out those around us who are expecting us to be your hands and feet. Those that are looking for your love those that look to the church for healing, for comfort, for blessings in a life of struggle. Lord, help us to be those people, to be the church looking to you and following. Lord, we lift up all those who lead us this morning, our leaders in our community, in our church, in our country and around the world. In a time of struggle, Lord, we pray that they look to you for guidance. For you, God, are the one great unchanging aspect of this world. Lord, help us to look to you knowing that you will be there. Help us to speak to you in words from our heart, from the deepest parts of who we are, Lord. Help us lift up those things that we fear most, all that we've held hidden, Lord, help us to speak of it with you and be healed. 
All these things we pray this morning, as your precious Son has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. This morning we are in the book of 1 Samuel in the Old Testament. We're sharing there and reading about a woman of faith. Her name was Hannah. And Hannah has something that she can teach all of us as persons of faith. She was desperate. She had a desperate void in her life. And she continually, with fervency, went before God. And she shared in honesty with the Lord what her desperate issue was. And got her met her at the place of her faith. God met her at the place of her need, just as he does for all of us. So I invite you to take your pew Bible, if you would like, or your Bible that you brought from home. I mean, uh, NIV translation. And we'll share in the reading of 1 Samuel, beginning with the 12th verse. We're jumping into what, part of what all is going on, and I'll give you a little history of, of what we're talking about shortly. And as she kept on praying to the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was praying in her heart, and her lips were moving, but her voice was not heard. And Eli thought she was drunk and said to her, How long will you keep on getting drunk? Get rid of your wine. Not so, my Lord, Hannah replied. I am a woman who is deeply troubled. I have not been drinking wine or beer. I was pouring out my soul to the Lord. Do not take your servant for a wicked woman. I have been praying here out of my great anguish and grief. And Eli answered, Go in peace. May the God of Israel grant you what you have asked of him. And she said, May your servant find favor in your eyes. And then she went her way and ate something, and her face was no longer downcast. And early the next morning, they arose and worshipped before the Lord. And they went back to their home in Ramah, and Alec and I lay with Hannah his wife, and the Lord remembered her. So in the course of time, Hannah conceived and gave birth to a son. And she named him Samuel, because I asked the Lord for him. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. There was a teacher who was teaching her class fractions one day, and she thought she had accomplished a goal by teaching. But she wanted to drive home the fractions lesson just a little bit more. And there was a little boy in her class. His name was Robbie. Robbie's family had six in their family. So she used Robbie's family as illustration. And she asked Robbie. She said, Robbie, your mother bakes a pie. And then she cuts it into pieces. What percentage of the pie will you get? And Robbie thought for a second. And he looked at his teacher and he said, one-fifth. And she said, oh, let me explain this to you, Robbie. There's only one pie, and there's six people in your family, and your mother cuts it into sections or, or pieces for the whole family. What, do you, what percentage of the pie will you get? And Robbie looked at her. One-fifth, he said. And the teacher looked at Robbie, and she said, oh, Robbie, you don't understand. But with a very respectful way, he looked at his teacher and he said, Oh, ma'am, but you don't understand my mama. Because she would say she didn't want any. When we think about mothers, don't we think about the devotion and their love and, and of their giving nature? Uh, 98 years ago, President Woodrow Wilson, he deemed that the second Sunday in May would be designated by Act of Congress as a day to honor mothers with a public expression of love and reverence. And he, he said, for the mothers of our nation. 
you know, we honor our mothers today, but we have to be honest and say, I know this by talking to mothers, that it's not always easy to be a mother, is it? I mean, in fact, being a mother can be hard. There, there are difficult times. It's not always easy. Sometimes there's disappointment. There are challenges. You know, you have that child that gives you a headache. Um, they're just, things come along with being a mother. Today we're looking at a lady. Her name was Hannah. And Hannah can teach us something. She ultimately became a mother. But before she ever became a mother, she was a woman of faith. And she can teach us all about being a person of faith because of, of her faithfulness. And so I want to fill you in on what's happening. Israel, it's not a good time in Israel's history. The book of Judges ends with this verse, in verse 25 of the 21st chapter. In those days, Israel had no king, and everyone did as he saw fit. Israel was unhealthy. There was no king in authority. People were running wild. The history was absolutely going to the dogs. The nation around the nation of Israel, the nations around, were oppressing them. And because of the lack of leadership, things were just moving from bad to worse continually. But judges were established to be an authority in the vacancy of the king. And those judges, they did not have what it takes to govern, to rule, to reign. They had character flaws that caused devastation to the nation of Israel. And so things continually were struggling. And God would use Hannah in a way that would bring back order. And so Hannah enters the picture. And you and I, we have an opportunity to look at Hannah as a, as a woman of faith. And we see in Hannah traits that describe a woman of faith, but not only a woman of faith, the traits in Hannah really describe a person of faith and who we are to be. Because Hannah teaches us that persons of faith have real problems in their life. That persons of faith aren't exempt to having some hard times. They have real problems, but they face those problems with real faith. And that's what Hannah did. Now, Hannah's husband was Elkanah. And Hannah was his first wife. But because Hannah couldn't have children, he selected a second wife. And you know what, women? That caused a lot of problems in that house. It was a lot of problems. But the second wife was able to have children. And so she, she, through that marriage, there were sons that were, were birthed. And Hannah carried this shame that she couldn't have children. She carried that shame with her daily. Many thought, mistakenly, the result of her not being to have children was a curse. And we know that's not true. Hannah was looked down upon because she couldn't have children. She was looked down upon spiritually and socially and emotionally. She just wasn't looked at as a person of value or worth because she couldn't have children. Hannah would have been the, the woman today that would not have come to church. Because today would have been really too hard for her. To have heard the word mother and, and heard the word children and motherhood. It would have really caused her a lot a lot of grief and, and pain out of her own desperation. Elka and I took his two wives. It was, was the yearly custom to go to Shiloh to worship. And they took their children and, and the whole family went. And you know it was the custom that you would take an offering to make. Eli was the priest at the temple. And the priest would take the offering that you would make sacrifice it, and then give you back a portion of, of the meat. Then it was your responsibility to take the meat, prepare it, cook it, and then serve it and eat it. And so that's what Elkanah does. He does that. He takes the meat. It's prepared. And he serves it to his second wife, Penai, and, and the children. 
And he gives them a standard portion. But you know what he does for Hannah? To Hannah, he gives a double portion of meat. I mean, he supersizes her meal. He pays the extra 75 cents so he can get the bigger hamburger for her. He thinks that's going to make Hannah happy. You know, give her the bigger portion of meat. Give her the bigger piece of the pie. Give her the piece of cake. Because he wants to honor Hannah even though she's unable to have children. Hannah is distraught over this. Hannah's not really thankful over this thank offering. She's thankful that she has a husband that would, would be that considerate of her. But she's sad. And she's frustrated. And she's desperate. See, Alkanai's house was divided. Hannah had no children. Second wife had children. But the wives didn't get along. And the second wife was always hovering over Anna, Hannah. And reminded her she couldn't have children. Making Hannah feel worse about herself. She provoked Hannah. She needled Hannah. She harassed Hannah. And every year when they came to Shiloh, it just seemed to intensify. And Hannah was hurt. And Hannah would weep when she got to Shiloh. And, and at this point in time, not only is she weeping, but she's lost her appetite. She doesn't even want to eat the double portion of the offering that has been offered to her. And Alkanai, Alkanai finds Hannah crying. And he was surprised by this. I mean, she's been given food to eat. And she's been given the love of her husband. And so he questions her. And he says, well, so why is she weeping? Why doesn't she eat? Why has she lost her appetite? Why is she so sad? I mean, he thought he was enough in her life to cover her pain. Because, women, I know you know this, but sometimes men just don't understand the root of your pain, right? He didn't understand the root of her pain or her desperation. He thought he was enough. He was a gift to her. But she didn't see it that way. She was thankful that he cared. She was grateful for his love. But she was a woman that was desperate. She was a woman that had pain in her life. But God understood the pain. I mean, God understands pain. But Hannah did something that a person of faith does when, they're dead, when they have pain. She does something that a person of faith does when everything's out of control. When things aren't just working right. She prays. She expresses her faith in God in prayer. And she takes that desperation. She takes that problem. And she takes it before the Lord. Because God can use our problems to get our attentions so that, and to teach us to trust. Hannah, ultimately, she was weeping, but her weeping led her to worship. And her worship led her to prayer. And that's a lesson for all of us. It's a big lesson for all of us. Not to stay in our desperation. Not to stay in the hard time. Not to stay in our place of pain. But to take it and offer it to the Lord. And she did that in prayer. And that's where you and I started reading this morning. In verse 12. And Eli is the priest. And he comes and he sees Hannah praying. And Hannah's not praying just a little bitty meek prayer. She's not praying a prayer that's from the bitterness of her soul. No, she's praying a prayer of faith. And he sees her mouth moving. And he sees her emotion. And he sees her desperateness. He sees her tears. But he confuses that with her being drunk. He doesn't understand. And Hannah has to explain to him, I'm not drunk. I'm not drunk at all. I'm just praying and sharing my heart, pouring my heart out before the Lord. And he looks on her. Hannah has prayed. What she's praying about is she desires a child, a son especially. And she's made a vow to the Lord in her prayer that if she would just be blessed with the offspring of a son... 
She would dedicate that son back to God to serve as a Nazarite, to serve in the Levit as a Levitical priest and follow the Levitical order. Eli hears her heart. Eli understands that Hannah has something right here. I mean, children are important. And children are important to parents. But Eli understands that Hannah has it right. That they're also for the Lord. And Hannah, she prayed. And ultimately, when she finished praying, and she had a conversation with Eli, the priest, he said to her, Go in peace. And may the God of Israel grant you what you have asked of Him. Now, Hannah then, she was at a place of surrender. She had really poured out her heart before the Lord. She thought she had surrendered it to God and suddenly her appetite came back. And she was able to eat and, and she was able to worship. I mean, don't ever under, underestimate the power of prayer, especially a praying woman. The founder of Methodism, the father of Methodism was John Wesley. His mother was Susanna Wesley and she was a praying mother. In fact, she spent time daily praying over her children. She prayed over each of them, over her children, specifically one hour a week. And she had 19 of them. She had given birth to 25. But out of her faithfulness and prayer... Two of her children emerged, and John and Charles Wesley, to change hearts of people, to cause people to fall in love with the Lord, and to have their hearts changed by the power of the gospel. A woman of faith exhibits real problems, experiences real problems, but it expresses faith in those times of problems through prayer. And that's what Hannah did. And that's a defining trait of a person of faith. But God met her at the point of her need. Because God always does. God's answer may be very different from what we ever expected. But God is God who provides. And verse 19 tells us that early the next morning, they got up and they worshipped before the Lord before they returned home. And then after they returned home, things changed for Hannah. And her desperate pleas were transformed into prayers of thanksgiving. And she ultimately gave birth to a, a, boy, a baby boy, Samuel, who ultimately would be a prophet king one day for Israel. See, Hannah kept her promise to God then. Then she kept her promise to God and when Samuel was three years old, she dedicated him back to God. A woman of faith. A person of faith can look at Hannah's life and see these four traits that I've mentioned that we need in our life. Because you and I as people of faith, we experience real problems. But we pray in faith. And in praying in faith, we will experience God's provision. And when we make a promise, we must keep it to God. Sam Rosenberg tells a story about his family. His father's name was Solomon. And his grandparents, his parents, and his siblings were all imprisoned during the Holocaust because they were Jews. And they were taken away and placed in a concentration camp. And in the concentration camp where they were placed, they were told that the whole family could remain together. But what the, what the whole catch in the whole thing was, was they would be sent out on work duties. And when they came back, they could be together. But if they came but they grew weak, they would be taken away and exterminated. So daily the family was desperate to make it through, not, to not grow weak, to not become sick, 
but to, to bear the responsibility of the workload of that day. But ultimately, the older Rosenberg parents, grandparents, they couldn't keep up. And they grew weak and they grew fail, frail and they were captured and they were taken away and they were exterminated. And it just left the family. And daily, the parents and the children, they would go out working. They would come back at night, thankful they had one more time together, and they were huddled together in their barracks. One day, Samuel, he came back. His brother David wasn't anywhere around. And he was crying in the corner by himself. And his father came and, and he said, Where's your brother? Isn't he with you? And he turned and he looked up at his dad and he said, Daddy, today David was not strong enough to do his work. So they took him away. And he said, But where's your mother? He could barely speak. And finally he was able to speak in his tears and he said, well, when they came to get David, he was afraid and he cried. So mama took his hand and she went with him. That's the kind of love a mother has for a child. And that was the kind of love that Hannah had for Samuel. She was willing to take his hand and give him back to the Lord. So that he could be led to do things that were great and wonderful. And you know what? That's the kind of love God has for us. When we're desperate, He hears our cries. When we're feeble, He meets our need. When we stretch out our hand, He takes hold of it. And He walks with us. Because He knows our pain. He knows we can't make it alone. He knows we need His love. And He always meets us at the place of our need. I mean, God loves us so much that He sent His Son to be the Lord and Savior of our life. He sent His Son. Even though He was a father, He had a mother's heart in sending His Son so that we may know love, may be changed by love, may share love, and may be people of faith. Today, we thank our Lord that His love is made so complete in us through the gift of His Son. And we thank God today that He's provided women of faith in our life that have taught us to trust in the Lord. And in our desperateness, we have a God who always meets us. Sometimes we have to stretch out our hand and we have enough strength to do it and He takes it. But even when we do not have enough strength to stretch out, of our, hand, out our hand, He's our God who comes by and takes our hand wherever it is and leads us in faith. Lord, today we thank You. We thank you that you are a God who loves us. We are people that are sometimes desperate. And we are people that know pain. And you are, you are a God who is faithful. And you meet us at the place of our desperation. You meet us in the place of our pain. Just as you did for Hannah. Lord, you do it for us. Father, may we be people of real faith. Thank you for loving us enough as a father but with a mother's heart to show us your love through the gift of your son Jesus Christ. And may your love transform our lives all the days of our lives. And it's in your holy name we pray. And together we say, Amen. This morning our closing hymn is hymn number 191, Jesus Loves Me. This morning our hymns were selected by some of the mothers of our church. This is T.B. Fitch's favorite hymn and so we were singing this this morning I want to offer to you this invitation and that is if you'd like to come to our church family here at 
First United Methodist Church of Bella Vista, we certainly would love to receive you here. And you're invited to come by transfer of your membership from another church family. Or on profession of your faith in Jesus Christ, the Savior and Lord of your life. The altar is here for you, and it's always here for you to come in your, your pain or in your desperation, but in your joy and in your praise. But please know that you're welcome and invited to become a part of this church. I invite you to stand, and I invite you to join me as we sing together hymn 191. I have a gift for all the ladies, whatever age you are, girls to ladies. There's a carnation that you will receive when you leave this morning there in the narthex. So I hope you'll, you'll come out those doors so that we can present you a gift in honor of this day. As you know, white, a white carnation symbolizes your mother if she's passed away, or, or red if she's living, or, or you may want a pink one, and we have those for you. So please come, we'd love to present you those gifts this morning. Thank you for being with us today. Please remember Helen Claire Bothwell's memorial service this coming Tuesday at 3 o'clock in the afternoon and join with us then. And remember to red, wear red next week as we celebrate Pentecost. God bless you. Go now in the knowledge our God is God who's faithful in our past. He's faithful in this very present moment. And he's faithful for our future. Don't just come to church, but go out and be the church.